This hearing will come to order. Uh, almost one year ago, as Vladimir Putin amassed his forces along the border with Ukraine, most of the world assumed the Russian military was one of the most powerful on Earth. But for nearly a year, brave Ukrainians, from army recruits to retired grandmothers, have exposed just how weak the Kremlin military really is. Because a leader who sends his soldiers into battle with almost no food is weak. An army that gives its recruits instructions to use their weapons taken from Wikipedia is weak. Generals using maps from the 1960s to fight a war in 2022 are weak. Nothing underscores Putin's weakness more than his reliance on the Wagner group of mercenaries, a group that Putin's uh, chef, a former convict, a man sanctioned by the United States, leads like a paramilitary death squad, a group recruiting violent criminals from Russian prisons and sending them into battle as cannon fodder. Human Rights Watch documented one incident in central, uh, the, uh, the Central Africa Republic where Wagner mercenaries stopped a group of unarmed men at a roadblock. As the witness began to pray out loud, the Russians forced the men to kneel, and one by one, they shot them in the head. These aren't just criminals. They are war criminals. And they are leading the fight in Ukraine today for Putin because Putin is failing spectacularly. In fact, I'm considering legislation to strengthen our tools to counter the Wagner group, prohibiting transactions with those buying their natural resources, as well as restricting security assistance to countries supporting this mercenary army. Their reach is growing as Putin gets weaker. And the weaker he gets, the more dangerous he gets, the more suffering he causes. How many civilians will die from Russian missile attacks in Ukraine because Putin can't achieve his battlefield goals? What will Putin do as he gets more desperate? More letter bombing campaigns in NATO countries? Threats of nuclear war? Now, I have been supportive of the administration's response to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. From supplying critical weapons systems and trainings to shoring up our allies in Europe to supporting the millions of refugees who have fled this war, including welcoming so many to the United States. But as I have said all along, this support should have come sooner. Ukraine's embrace of good governance reforms in the years leading up to Russia's invasion directly contributed to the success we're seeing today. And while we are still learning more details, I want to commend President Zelensky and his cabinet for their serious oversight plans for U.S. and international assistance. As I have said since Putin's invasion, and I'll say it again to the Ukrainian people, we will continue to support your heroic efforts to achieve victory. We will stand with you as your fight for your homeland against a dictator trying to erase your nation by force. We will work with you uh, so that a free and democratic Ukraine that respects the will and rights of its people survives and flourishes after this war comes to an end. We will continue to work with those countries Putin threatens from encouraging energy diversification to shoring up democratic institutions to stop Putin from spreading his poisonous autocratic savagery. And we must also support those Russians who are in prison because they are brave enough to stand up against Putin's war machine. Now, I am disappointed that the administration has not met its statutory deadline to make a determination with respect to Magnitsky sanctions in response to the arrest of Vladimir Karamusa. So Secretary Newland, I hope you will tell us when we can get a response to our letter on this matter. I look forward to getting a full picture today from this entire panel on what the Departments of State, Pentagon, USAID do is doing to support Ukraine and counter future Russian aggression. In the immediate term, I think there is a, um, a uh, question that, uh, that needs to be answered, um, which is, what is our strategy for helping Ukraine achieve victory? How are we taking the lessons from the Ukrainian war to think about preparing ourselves and our partners for potential aggression from Russia in the future? Because while Ukrainians are on the front lines of fighting for democracy and the rule of law now, we know that Putin's ambitions do not end on his borders. 
The United States and our democratic allies must show the authoritarian regimes of the world that the invasion and subjugation of free people is unacceptable in the modern world. It's a violation of the international rule of law, and that is what is also at stake in Ukraine. Yes, it is about the freedom of the Ukrainian people to decide their own future, but it is also to stand up for the universal proposition that you cannot by force take another country's territory. And with that, let me turn to the distinguished ranking member for his remarks, Senator Risch. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, let me say I concur in uh, remarks that you have made, and I'm going to make some similar uh, remarks along those lines. I look forward to having a concrete discussion on the Biden administration's policy toward Russia. I hope to hear from you how the United States is planning to do more and faster to help defeat Russia in Ukraine and counter Russian aggression and malign influence around the world. Indeed, we aren't the only ones that are hungry for this. I think if you look around this room and see the attendance today and see the gaggle of uh, media people out in the hall shouting questions at us, uh, everyone is hungry for this discussion. And I hope we uh, have a robust discussion on that today. It's been almost a year ago now that Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine turned the status quo of international relations on its head. In response to this uh, bold escalation, the United States and our allies around the world quickly uh, came to a consensus that we need to support Ukraine's defense of its people, territory, and uh, way of life from Russian aggression. Uh, whenever we have our discussion like this, it really ought to start with a, sh a short, very short, and brief discussion of how we got here. Uh, we all know that Ronald Reagan spent eight years uh, in his presidency as his top priority bringing down and breaking up the Soviet Union and pulling those uh, satellite countries away from Russia. He was successful. He got that done. And uh, we, uh, as uh, America, adopted that as our policy. Uh, we promoted it. We helped it in every way we can. One of the things that uh, uh, happened, of course, was all the countries that were in the uh, orbit of the USSR pulled away and went on uh, their own way. That uh, breakup uh, included four countries that had nuclear weapons at the time. One was Russia, of course, one was Kazakhstan, one was Belarus, and one was Ukraine. Uh, obviously, uh, it's also the policy of the United States to contain uh, nuclear weapons and uh, be against proliferation wherever possible. On December 5th of uh, 1995, the United States uh, sat down uh, in uh, Budapest, Hungary, with the Ukrainians, with the Brits at the table and with the Russians at the table, and entered into an, into an agreement whereby they, uh, that is all of us, asked the Ukrainians to give up their nuclear weapons in return for which Ukraine would get security for their borders and against an invasion by any country. All four of us signed that. Uh, the Ukrainians did what they agreed to do. They gave up their nuclear weapons. And where do they find themselves uh, in 2022? Facing an invasion by one of the countries that actually signed that agreement. We have not only a moral obligation, but a legal obligation to do what we said we'd do on December 5th of 1995, and we're doing that. Over the past year, extensive discussions have taken place about how the U.S. and our allies can support Ukraine. Uh, that is the uh, conversation of uh, about every conversation you enter into here in D.C. However, these discussions get bogged down by fears of giving Ukraine too much equipment too quickly for fear of, of upsetting Moscow. I'm tired of hearing that. Everyone talks about the need to hand Russia a strategic defeat in Ukraine, but the administration's policy stopped short of fully supporting that goal. What is missing is a more robust discussion about U.S. policy toward Russia now and, just as importantly, beyond the current conflict. Any notion that we can interact with Russia like we did a year ago was shattered by the invasion, uh, but also by Russia's noncompliance with the New START Treaty and many other malign actions it's taken around the world. It is, it is not only soured its relationship with us, it has soured its relationship with uh, virtually the rest of the planet, with the exception of a half a dozen uh, of uh, what I call no good Nick countries that uh, are in league with them. I expect our witnesses to help us better understand the administration's plans to confront all of Russia's malign influence. It is critical that U.S. foreign policy be informed by a long-term vision for a future where Russia coexists with its neighbors and does not threaten to destabilize the international community. 
Uh, unfortunately, the Biden administration has so far not made clear a concrete policy for how the United States will directly confront Russia as a strategic adversary. While Putin has irre uh, irreversibly tied the fate of his, re his regime to the outcome of the war in Ukraine, there is so much more to confronting Russia uh, that the United States must consider. It is essential that the Biden administration's Russia policy, policy be characterized by leadership and initiative. I hope your testimony and responses will be given with a focus on that overreaching Russia policy today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Risch. With that, let me turn to our witnesses. Uh, a longtime participant uh, with this committee under Secretary for Political Affairs, Victoria Newland, has been a diplomat for more than 30 years. She started very young. Uh, among her many allocates, she previously led the Europe and Eurasia Bureau at this, and served as ambassador to NATO and was the State Department's spokesperson. We're also joined by USAID's assistant administrator in the Bureau for Europe and Eurasia, Erin McKee, our former ambassador to Papua New Guinea, to the Solomon Islands, and to the Republic uh, of Vanuatu, who began her career working on the post-Soviet space. And finally, we welcome Assistant Secretary Wallander, who has worked on Russia at the National Security Council and the Pentagon for many years and has published extensively on Russia and Europe while outside of government. So welcome to you all. Your full statements will be included in the record without objection. I'd ask you that you try to summarize your statements in about five minutes or so so that members of the committee can have a conversation with you with that. Uh, Madam Secretary, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of the, this committee. It's an honor for all of us to join you for this first hearing of the new Congress. It's also appropriate that we're meeting on Ukraine as we approach the one-year anniversary, as you both said. First, let me thank this committee, the entire Congress, for your continued strong bipartisan support for Ukraine's battle for its sovereignty. Indeed, it's very right to exist. The more than $45 billion in supplemental funding for security, economic, humanitarian support that you approved in December for FY23 confirms for every Ukrainian fighter, medic, teacher, and electricity technician that America stands with them. And we stand with them in saying no to a vicious autocrat trying to redraw the maps of their country by force and no to any others around the world with similar ambitions. Because Ukraine's fight, as you have both said, is about so much more than Ukraine. It is about the world that our children and our grandchildren will inherit. Uh, since I last sat before this committee in September, Ukraine has regained control of large swaths of its territory in Kherson and in Kharkiv with strong US and international support. It has held the line so far in Bakhmut, albeit at very high costs, but taken losses in the surrounding towns in Solidar. It has valiantly withstood Putin's latest barbaric tactic, waves of drone and missile attacks on its heating, electricity, and water infrastructure, and with your help has begun to build back and modernize its systems as you know, there was another vicious attack in four cities last night, taking out heat and electricity for millions of Ukrainians. Ukraine is already building that back. And Ukraine has also put forward a set of principles for a just and sustainable peace and challenged Russia to engage meaningfully around that framework. And in just the last two weeks, in addition to last night, it has grieved the losses of so many more innocents. Russian missiles destroyed an apartment in Dnipro, and as you know, Ukraine lost senior members of its government in a tragic helicopter crash. Ukraine's fight must and will continue because as my boss, Secretary Blinken, has said so often, if Russia stops fighting, this war ends today. But if Ukraine stops fighting, Ukraine ends. That's also the message that all of you heard from President Zelensky when he made his historic visit to the Oval Office on December 21st and also addressed the joint session of Congress. As Putin continues to pour pain on Ukraine, Ukraine is fighting back with our support. As Assistant Secretary McKee and Assistant Secretary Wallander will outline in more detail, 
we and our allies are working with Ukraine now to get them the training, the equipment, and the support they need to defend themselves and to make another concerted effort this spring to push back Russian forces. This includes providing the Patriot air defenses, counter drone systems, Abrams main battle tanks, the Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, striker, artillery, and ammunition. We and our partners are also speeding equipment and spare parts to re Ukraine to rebuild and harden its critical infrastructure, including um, a gas turbine provided by AID just yesterday that's the size of a tennis court. Uh, we're also providing budget support, economic and humanitarian assistance, and supporting those collecting evidence of Russia's atrocities and crimes so there can be full accountability. Throughout this, the administration remains laser focused on ensuring that no aid or weapons are diverted. We have plumped up our embassy staff in Kyiv for technical oversight. We are also working with the World Bank, with Deloitte, and with a team of US government auditors who are in Kyiv uh, this week, in fact. And we continue to support essential reform and anti-corruption measures by the Ukrainian government across the country. Ukraine must not simply survive this war, it must emerge stronger, cleaner, more democratic, more European. That's what Ukraine's patriots are fighting for. That is also central to the support that the United States and our international partners provide. President Zelensky's decision this week to fire and accept the resignations of officials suspected of corruption sends a strong signal of Ukraine's own resolve in this regard. In the meantime, our coalition of support for Ukraine remains amazingly strong. In total, more than 50 partner nations have committed tens of billions of dollars in military, economic, humanitarian support and taken in millions of refugees. We've also worked, as you know, on the Black Sea grain deal, 17 million metric tons liberated from Port of Odessa. And we've helped U Europe reduce its dependence on Russian fossil fuel, more than doubling our own LNG exports to the continent. And we've imposed far-reaching sanctions and a global price cap on Russian oil to reduce revenues for Putin's vicious war machine without destabilizing energy markets. Yeah. Uh, none of this, none of what we've seen would have been in Ukraine over the past year would have been possible without daily acts of heroism by tens of millions of Ukrainians in all walks of life. But it's also true that much of it would have been impossible without the continued support of the Congress and the American people. President Biden has pledged that the US will support Ukraine for as long as it takes, and we are grateful for the partnership that we have with you in meeting this commitment because it's in our own national interests. We look forward to taking your questions. All right, it seems like the part of the Wagner group is trying to interfere with our hearing here. So we will, um, it seems like it may have stopped, so that's good. All right, Administrator McKee. Thank you, Chairman Men Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of this committee. I deeply appreciate the opportunity to testify about USAID's work to support the people of Ukraine and our wider efforts to counter Russian aggression throughout Europe and Eurasia. I also have to thank you for passing the four supplemental appropriations bills that allow the United States to present such a strong, united front in assisting Ukraine. Today, as we've noted, marks 335 days of, Kremlin's, of the Kremlin's senseless, brutal war on Ukraine. Close to 8 million Ukrainians are now refugees. 5.9 million Ukrainians are internally displaced. Some 430 children have been killed, and USAID partners have documented over 20,000 instances of alleged war crimes and human rights abuses. Putin's unjustified war continues to cause catastrophic loss of life and has undermined the security of Europe and the global economy. And yet, Putin drastically underestimated the Ukrainian people. The government of Ukraine still stands strong and capable. The Ukrainian people demonstrate daily heroism and bravery. 
Communities emerging from occupation exemplify this resilience despite the horror that they have endured. At USAID, we are proud to stand beside the Ukrainian people in their fight for freedom. Foreign assistance is a critical tool to realize the United States goals of helping Ukraine win its war for survival and achieve a lasting victory as a free, prosperous, independent country with a path towards EU accession. Ukraine will need a well-functioning state, a vibrant, inclusive economy, a free press, and strong institutions free from corruption to secure this future when the war ends. The supplemental resources generously appropriated by Congress allow USAID to address urgent needs immediately created by the conflict, while also remaining focused on what will be needed for recovery and reconstruction. With these funds, we are investing in Ukraine's economy and helping resuscitate it after the Kremlin's ruthless attacks on its civilian infrastructure. We are repairing the country's energy and heating systems to counter Putin's attempts to wield the harsh winter as a weapon against the people of Ukraine. We are protecting public health from the deadly consequences of Russia's war and support Ukraine's health system to restore services while at the same time advancing progress on critical reforms. And we continue to fight corruption at every level to build public trust, maintain that trust as well as donor support, attract critical private sector investment, safeguard the country's institutions, and speed its integration with the rest of Europe. We have also delivered on the United States commitment to provide reliable and sustained economic support to the Ukrainian government, which is critical to ensuring that Ukraine can defend itself and uphold the democratic government and society that is at the core of Putin's aggression against Ukraine. The $13 billion in direct budget support that USAID has provided thus far to the government of Ukraine through generous congressional appropriations has kept government services such as health care, education, and basic utilities running. This support has made it possible for the Ukrainian people to sustain their resolve even as Putin weaponizes winter with unrelenting attacks on the country's energy grid. USAID appreciates the fundamental responsibility being entrusted with these U.S. taxpayer funds, ensuring oversight of U.S. taxpayer dollars used to meet critical needs of Ukrainian citizens is USAID's priority for all budget support provided to the Ukrainian government. And the Ukrainian government stands as our partner in this accountability and knows we will be exercising extraordinary measures to track these funds. Beyond the region, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is harming the global economy and worsening global food insecurity due to disruptions to food, fuel, fertilizer supplies, and subsequent price volatility. As Russia becomes more aggressive in its energy policy, countries like Moldova are facing much higher prices and consequently are accelerating their transition to other energy sources with U.S. government assistance. The countries in Central Asia are also facing serious disruptions to their economies and food security and are seeking alternatives to Moscow, which USAID is working to support through regional cooperation. The consequences of Putin's unprovoked, unjustified war in Ukraine extend beyond the battlefield, beyond Ukraine, and beyond Europe. USAID will continue to stand with the Ukrainian people, and we are grateful for the support from Congress. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Secretary Wallander. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Rich, distinguished members of the committee, um, it is an honor to appear before you today to express the unwavering support of the United States for Ukraine's sovereignty and security in the face of Russia's unprovoked and brutal invasion. Thank you for holding this important hearing at this pivotal time for the security of Ukraine, of Europe, and of the world. As Secretary Austin said at the Halifax Security Forum this past November, our support for Ukraine's self-defense is an investment in our own security and prosperity. What happens in the coming months may prove decisive, and we are focused on providing Ukraine with the military capabilities it needs to defend its people and its territory. We are doing this in close cooperation with our allies and partners. First, we have focused on a layered, integrated approach to air defense to counter Russia's devastating attacks on Ukraine's population centers and civilian infrastructure. 
the Patriot capability from the United States, Germany, and the Netherlands will give Ukraine advanced long-range capability. These are complemented by the medium and short-range air defense capabilities, such as NASAMS and Avenger, that we have provided. Second, to enhance Ukraine's ability to maneuver, the United States will provide Abrams main battle tanks, the best tanks in the world. The United States has also committed, the United Kingdom has also committed Challenger tanks, and other European states will provide Leopard tanks. These main battle tanks are complemented by other vital armor capabilities, such as Bradleys and Strikers from the United States, Swedish CV-90s, French AMX-10s, and German Martyrs. Third, we have expanded US-led collective training to enable the Ukrainians to integrate fires and maneuver. Our training will complement the specialized training conducted by the United States, the European Union, and our allies. And finally, we continue to work with allies and partners to deliver a steady flow of artillery rounds and other ammunition so Ukraine can sustain its fight. Russia has discovered that the United States and our allies and partners are serious about supporting Ukraine for the long haul. Our assistance to Ukraine is possible thanks to bipartisan support from Congress. The Department of Defense appreciates the most recent Additional Supplemental Appropriations Act, which provided presidential drawdown authority, funding for the military services to replace items sent to Ukraine, and funding for the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, or USAI. Presidential drawdown allows us to get Ukraine critical capabilities quickly. USAI allows us to contract with industry for new and innovative solutions while building Ukraine's longer-term defense. We are also ramping up defense industrial base production of critical munitions and equipment, doubling or, in some cases, tripling capacity. Even as we focus on getting Ukraine what it needs, we have always prioritized accountability. And Ukraine has, too. We have adapted our accountability practices for the combat environment to address the risk of illicit diversion using mechanisms that go above and beyond our standard practices. The US government has not seen credible evidence of any diversion of US provided weapons outside of Ukraine. Instead, we see Ukraine's frontline units effectively employing security assistance every day on the battlefield. Nearly a year ago, Russia launched its brutal invasion to destroy Ukraine as a free and sovereign nation, threatening European security and transatlantic unity. Today, NATO is stronger, Europe is investing in its own security at record rates, and the incredible people and armed forces of Ukraine remain unbowed and unbroken. This war has demonstrated that aggression is not worth the price paid by the aggressor. That is a lesson that should reverberate around the world, including among autocratic leaders everywhere. As Secretary Austin has said, free people always refuse to replace an open order of rules and rights with one dictated by force and fear. We are determined to support Ukraine's fight against tyranny and oppression, and in doing so, to defend the American interests and values that are so clearly at stake. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you all for your testimony. We'll start a round of uh, five-minute questions, and uh, let me make some prefatory remarks before I go to my questions here. Um, I'm all in and have been since 2014 when I you know, waved my saber and said we should be far more responsive to the invasion of Crimea because it was the warning sign. And the world, including the United States, was relatively mute in its response to the invasion and annexation of Crimea. And so then Putin got the message that you can march on. And that's part of what's at stake now, that he can march on. Now, there are those I know who have an insular view and others who have a legitimate question. Uh, and as someone who, back at home in New Jersey, when I'm asked by 
my constituents, why are we spending so much money on Ukraine? I make the point to them that, in fact, what is at stake is not only the Ukrainians' freedom, which in and of itself is important, but also the proposition that you cannot by force take another country's territory. Because if that can become the rule of the day, there are many despots and authoritarians who will seek to do that. China in Taiwan, North Korea possibly against South Korea, the list is endless. Uh, but having said that, I would commend to you, Madam Secretary, uh, to speak to uh, the Secretary and to the administration that I think it's there is important that we articulate what is our definition of victory and what is the blueprint for victory in order to continue to have the bipartisan support of Congress for the resources that will be necessary to achieve that victory. I think that's critically important. Um, I'm not saying that we don't have one, but it hasn't been well articulated if there is one. And if there isn't a full vision of what that blueprint is, we should be thinking about what it is and how we execute on it. Uh, with that, uh, and we also, uh, I'm a strong supporter, I have voted for everything for the Ukrainians in past legislation going back to 2014. But we also have to tell our friends in Ukraine, you can't sell white phosphorus to the Azerbaijanis that kill Armenians. Uh, there are responsibilities as well, not just uh, the opportunity to receive resources. Um, my first question is about sanctions, and it is particularly uh, about China. As you well know, President Putin met with Chinese President Xi Jinping in February of 22, where they touted their No Limits Partnership, just weeks before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Since that time, I understand there's been evidence uh, that Chinese companies, including working through Hong Kong, have been exporting dual-use technologies, including semiconductor chips, which are critically important uh, to fill in, particularly on missile guidance systems, that Russia needs to continue its onslaught of Ukraine. It seems to me that um, we should not forsake uh, the potential of sanctions against China if it is providing critical assistance. Uh, and it shouldn't be able to hide uh, behind uh, some companies. Have we raised these concerns at the highest levels of the Chinese government? Uh, is this support from China to Russia not a direct violation of U.S. sanctions? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and for your strong personal support uh, for Ukraine and your perfect articulation of what's at stake here, which the President agrees with, as he said yesterday. Uh, with regard to China, yes, from well before this latest invasion began, in November and December even of 21, we began an intense conversation with China at every level, which the President himself has led, um, and all of our senior leaders have been involved in. With regard to, uh, to their uh, their relationship with Russia and about their own interests, in our view, in upholding the UN Charter and not allowing uh, Putin-style uh, rules of the road to, to dominate. And we've made clear that we will bring to their attention when we see sanctions violations by their companies. Um, and we've been very clear with regard to the impact on our relationship and their standing in the world. I just, don't, I just don't think that we have followed up those conversations with robust sanctions against companies that are providing dual-use technology that is allowing the Russians to continue to have access to missile capabilities that we should not let them have. Uh, it seems Chairman, to me that you know, we, we, mm -hmm. we need to, in addition to all the money that we are providing, all the... the you know, defense equipment we're providing. We need to cut the head of the snake off in every way we can. And that means sanctioning it directly and its inner core, which I give the administration credit for, but it also means sanctioning those vigorously who are assisting Russia in, in this unjust and unholy war. And we so I hope we will be far more robust in that regard. I don't care that it's China, I don't care who it is. At the end of the day, they cannot act with impunity and face no consequence. We agree with that, Chairman. 
And we have a new set of sanctions out today, uh, which I think you will see some of the things that you've been calling for, I'll look to that. particularly with regard to. I don't know if you're familiar directly with what I mentioned in my opening statement about the Magnitsky letter on Vla Vladimir Karamusa. Uh, it has passed the time statutorily to get an answer. I see no reason uh, why, in fact, uh, we cannot, in essence, have sanctions against someone who's one of Russia's biggest critics. Putin's biggest critics, not Russia's biggest critics, Putin's biggest critics, and is jailed as a result of it, uh, we should make it clear uh, through Magnitsky sanctions, Senator Card has been the author uh, of that law. This is an example of what it was meant to use. And so can you get us an answer, please? Uh, we're not only going to get you an answer, we're going to get you Magnitsky sanctions in, in very short order. Bravo, bravo, bravo. All right, now, uh, lastly, um, you know, uh, what are we doing um, as it relates uh, to the uh, need for um, uh, some of us who went to The Hague uh, earlier la last year to press the case on uh, sanctions and prosecutions against those who are committing war crimes? There, there must be. There must be accountability. And accountability without prosecutions is not accountability. Are we focused on that as well? We are, Chairman. We have a G7 working group of lawyers as well as the group of G7 political directors that I'm involved in looking at various models of accountability. There are three or four under consideration. I think we'll have more to say about that as we approach the anniversary in terms of the, the actual setting up of judicial proceedings. But in the meantime, uh, and Aaron can speak to this in more detail, uh, we are involved in supporting all kinds of accountability mechanisms on the ground in Ukraine, everything from collecting evidence to supporting the cataloging of atrocities, et cetera. And we're working with the Ukrainians on some interim measures of registries of attack, et cetera, that could be used for future accountability. I don't know if Erin has anything she wants to add there. Thank you, Senator. We uh, are working very closely on the ground through our human rights and access to justice centers that have a network throughout Ukraine, over 22 locations, to, to gather and document the evidence for such time to be able to, as you said, prosecute and, and hold accountable um, those actions inside Ukraine. So we're, we, we aren't waiting for the determination for that process to be set up, but preparing all we can so that when it is in place, swift and uh, appropriate uh, uh, due process can be made and the evidence is available. The earlier that possible prosecutions are prosecuted and successfully done will send a chilling effect to those who think they can act with impunity. Senator Rick. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Newland, what you said there are going to be new sanctions out today. Uh, who are those going to be against? Who, who are the targets of those sanctions? Uh, ranking member Rich, there are more than 40 sanctions coming out. They may actually have been published at about 10.30. The vast majority of them are against uh, Prigozhin and the Wagner Group in Africa. There are also sanctions against uh, Putin's cronies, against uh, those who provide material support to Russia's military industrial complex. Um, and then uh, there is one in particular that addresses uh, the chairman's question with regard to China. Yeah, we're, uh, the chairman and I have both been uh, anxious to see what's happening with China because China seems to be acting with impunity and uh, uh, that we really need to ratchet up our, our sanctions in that regard. Nobody, they may be big, but they're not uh, too big to fail in that regard. And uh, we, we really need to, uh, to ratchet the sanctions up there. Um, also, uh, Secretary Newland, first of all, I, I think most of us here were glad to see that uh, finally the administration yesterday agreed to provide Abrams tanks, um, and we've been calling for this for some time, uh, but we've been repeatedly told over the months that sending tanks to Ukraine was not possible or desirable or would somehow be escalatory, and all of a sudden it changed yesterday. What? How did that, this is embarrassing, how, how did that change? What happened? Well, I'm going to uh, let Assistant Secretary Wallander talk about the 
internal uh, discussion inside the Pentagon. What I will say to you, uh, Ranking Member, is that uh, Abrams, as you know, are very sophisticated tanks and they require significant training. So even as we approved them uh, yesterday, it's going to take some time to get them to the battlefield. So this is not something that's going to appear in time for the spring offensive. What is which, most which needed, brings it, which underscores what I said. You know, we've been asking for this for six months. Had you started six months ago, they'd be all ready for the spring offensive. So, what 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 happened here? Who's who's to blame for this? You know, I think at every stage of this, we have looked at what the Ukrainians have needed, what they've been requesting. There was a period in the fall where they were capturing a huge number of. Russian tanks on the battlefield, which they were able to use successfully in the Kherson and Kharkiv offensive, but now they need more, and so we are responding. Well, it didn't answer the question, but uh, I, I guess uh, we're not going to get an answer to that question. But I, I got to tell you, it's you know the, uh, all through this thing, we've been we've been pressing the uh, the administration to do things, and and usually they do the right thing but it takes forever to get there. And uh, as a result of that, there's a great loss on the battlefield and, and lives lost in the meantime. So I, I want to underscore that uh, the administration truly needs to act uh, more rapidly. Uh, that brings us, uh, uh, Secretary Walter, to the, uh, to the striker combat vehicles. As we all know, there's different versions of the striker vehicles. And uh, one of the things that the Ukraine's been asking for is the uh, strikers that are equipped with the cannons that are comparable to those found on tanks. But the administration's declining to give them those. They're giving them something with only machine guns and no heavy weapons, and they're really not much more than an armored taxi cab. What, what's going on there? Can, can we expect a reversal of that, hopefully, in the near future? Um, Senator, I, I do not have information on the specific variant of striker um, vehicles, uh, APCs, uh, as you refer to. What I will say is that the— You, you do know that they're not going to—they've decided, or at least they're telling us, they're not going to give them the ones with the, uh, with the cannons that are found on the tanks. I would need to validate that, uh, Senator, so, but I will speak to the value of the striker capability and the, and the volume of the striker capability. We know the, we know the value of the striker capability, and we know how, how much it's enhanced if it's got a cannon on it instead of uh, machine guns. So I'm, I'm not really interested in that part of the answer, but uh, uh, I, I, again, I would urge you, and I suppose the way things go, eventually they'll do it, but they need to do it, and they, need to, need, they really need to do it uh, rapidly. Um, well, I, my time's almost up. I, at some point in time, we need to have a really good uh, discussion of what's going to happen when this is over. It will be over at some point in time. Either the, either the Russians will quit fighting, the Ukrainians will quit fighting. Neither one of them are near that point uh, at this point. But uh, what's going to happen in the future? Look, we're, we're not going to go back to doing business with Russia as we have before. And uh, so as a result of that, uh, we need to talk about how we're going to interact with Russia. The, the Europeans are already doing that. When they come to see me, they've, they've already got blueprints as far as where, how they're going to change directions. So I'd like to hear how we're going to change directions. With that, uh, my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank our three witnesses, not just for their testimony today, but for your service to our country. Uh, I want to follow up on Chairman Menendez's last point first. And that is accountability. Tomorrow is Holocaust Remembrance Day, 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. I appreciate and believe we're making substantial progress in maintaining the evidence to pursue war crimes or crimes against humanity uh, for those that are responsible at the highest levels. Early action is going to be important. Is there any hope that we could move forward with some recognized international mechanism that could start the process so that there is, there, it's known internationally that accountability is going to be part of the resolution of this conflict? So Senator Cardin, as I said, we're working hard on this with our G7 partners and with Ukraine. What we want to do I understand do you're working on gathering the evidence. No, no, no. Like also on which of the various models for uh, so what's pursuing the timing justice. on that? You know, um, I would like to see us come to conclusion before the anniversary in, in around February, but it may take another few months, but certainly before the summer, I would hope. 
And um, that I would also note that uh, when I was out with the secretary in, in Kiev in uh, September, we went to Irpin to see one of the towns that had been decimated by Russian missiles. And we met with some of the non-governmental organizations that AID is supporting who were minutely uh, gathering evidence and plotting it. So no, I, I appreciate the yes. fact that I've been actually briefed on some of the evidence that's actually been obtained. Yep. It's, it's, the, my concern is will we have a mechanism that will allow the international community to observe that accountability is actually being pursued? I, Such I as like the Nuremberg trials after World War II. Are we going to have some mechanism like that? If I understand your answer, we should know that in the next couple months. That that is my, our aspiration, and uh, you know, in another setting, I can brief you on the various options we're considering. Uh, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll, I'll yes, uh, I'll pursue that. You've mentioned the longer we've all mentioned the Walner Group several times, and as I understand, there will be some additional sanctions in regards to those involved in the Wagner Group. You have taken certain steps to designate them as a international criminal uh, group. You haven't done, designated them as a foreign terrorist organization. Why not, and what else can we do? Because this is not only a threat to what's going on in Ukraine, this is a global threat. Uh, what else can we do to um, show uh, that we are doing everything we can to protect against the growth of this type of an organization? We went, Senator, with the transnational criminal organization designation because it better suits the way Wagner operates, particularly what it's doing in Africa, that they are in this uh, for their own material gain and for power and for ripping off the wealth of states, particularly in Africa. So in addition to um, sanctioning the main entities, we are now working on the sanctions today go to some of those supporting entities uh, of Wagner, those they do business with. We're also looking at um, gold and other main sources of revenue for the, for the Wagner team. You know, as you know, they have access to gold mines in Mali and in Central African Republic. They are seeking more of that, and that directly funds the combat that they are engaged in in Ukraine. So we're working on some of those measures. Um, and we're working with African governments and encouraging those who've gotten in bed with Wagner to re rethink um, and trying to strengthen those who are under threat of Wagner now. Do you need any further guidance or support from, by congressional action? Uh, not at this moment, but as we pursue the drying up of the financial network of Wagner, uh, we may come back to you if we may. And then, as you know, in another setting, we can talk about some of the other activities that we are involved with. Thank you. I, I want to uh, just mention one point in regards to the USAID. I uh, understand you are now using some of the U.S.-Russia investment fund dollars have been successfully uh, rededicated to help Ukraine. Uh, can you just give us a quick status on the use of those funds? Thank you, Senator. Yes, it was, um, uh, I think, uh, with uh, your help and, and uh, bipartisan support, we were able to unlock uh, those funds that have been frozen, frankly, for 15 years. Um, and we are providing uh, the vast majority of those reflows that have been frozen to uh, WINICEF, which is the Western or newly independent states uh, enterprise fund to stimulate and support small and medium enterprise growth um, and um, activity and access to finance and credit in Ukraine and Moldova, which is part of their mandate. Um, and the, uh, the conclusion of the modifications to the various instruments was done right before the holidays. And uh, we are rolling ahead now with um, identifying those opportunities. I need to note that WINICEF um, did not stop working um, inside Ukraine at the start of the war, or the second invasion, um, and immediately uh, mobilized their team, their network, and their clients to relocate and stay in business, which was vital to continue to help provide both livelihoods and income as well as revenue to the government of Ukraine. Just please keep us informed as to how those funds are being utilized. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Paul. It has been argued that uh, all we need is more sanctions, and uh, there is an argument that sanctions have value, 
but it's the unwinding and the leverage of removing sanctions that actually accomplishes something, not adding more sanctions. In fact, Ms. Newland, when you went to Moscow in October of 2021, you were only allowed to go because there was a negotiation in advance of that where we agreed to take sanctions off of a Russian individual and Russia agreed in tandem to take sanctions off of you. I've had this discussion for quite a while. We have sanctions on 25 members of the Duma, mostly for political reasons, because they've politically spoken out against U.S. interests, but they are, of course, Russians. They also, in turn, sanction us as well, so 25, 30 members of Congress are sanctioned as well. Uh, do you favor or oppose some sort of arrangement similar to your arrangement where sanction removal was traded to enhance diplomacy? Do you favor that for legislative uh, sanctions? On individuals, Senator Paul, in the in the context of a Russian decision to negotiate seriously and withdraw its forces from re Ukraine and return territory, uh, I would certainly favor, and I believe Secretary Blinken would also favor. I, I don't think hard, I don't think context. hardly taking off sanctions on a member of the Duma is going to be traded for the end of the war. I mean, I wish it were that easy. What I'm talking about is allowing members of their Duma, many of whom may be favorable to our country, to travel to our country, and vice versa. I'm talking about diplomatic legislative exchange. I'm not talk, talking about trading it for peace. I'm sure that would be great, but I don't think that's really on the table, trading, you know, removing sanctions on Senator Risch for peace. I, you know, I wish that were important enough, but I don't know that that's going to happen. But that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about very small, incremental removal of sanctions on legislative members in exchange for them doing the same. Uh, Senator, all of the members of the Duma on whom we have sanctions are people who have supported Russia's war, the annexation of Crimea, et cetera. That would uh, be about 90% of the people yeah, of Russia. I mean, I mean, it probably would be 90% of the Duma. We only have sanctions on 25 or 30, but I, I would venture to say every member of the Duma probably supports Crimea. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is their perspective. And if we are going to sanction people for their belief in, you know, their sort of nationalist version of the world, then we won't have any, we won't have any discussion between people or any legislative exchange. Senator, I would say that if it is in U.S. interest for there to be conversations with Russians, we should look hard at what can be done to facilitate I, I would, I would argue that it is. There's been a great deal of discussion about uh, prosecutions. Let's drag people to The Hague. Let's have some prosecutions. Uh, would Putin be one of those targets? Senator, he is uh, certainly guilty of prosecuting war crimes. He's certainly the leader of this illegal aggression. I, as I said, so it sounds to like Senator the administration Cardin, would favor taking him to the Hague. As I said to Senator Cardin, we are now looking with our allies and partners and the Ukrainians at the appropriate judicial right. mechanism, and that would right. um, indicate the scope. Of but what if would you're be if you're really thinking ultimately that there might be a peaceful settlement that doesn't involve unconditional surrender by the Russians or vice versa by the Ukrainians. Um, you might at least put some thought into the fact that saying that he's guilty of, of war crimes and that it's a possibility he's going to The Hague, that it may make uh, any kind of settlement, peaceful settlement, or someone who is fighting a war less likely to, to prosecute a peace or to engage in peace talks if he thinks, hmm, if there's peace, we're, we're going to The Hague, you know, that there's going to be prosecutions. I'm not saying one way or another on the facts of whether there are war crimes. I'm just saying that if you say the leader of somebody in a war that you'd like to ultimately resolve is guilty of these things, I think it makes it very much less likely. I think it's a careless remark, and it's a remark that doesn't uh, really think fully through the ramifications of what you say. Because when you say that, I think you're basically saying this war is going to go on forever. And if, if you want to picture devastation, you see Ukraine now, in five years, it'll be worse. I mean, I don't imagine this getting better over the next five years, but if you preclude peace, I think you inevitably will make it worse. Senator, if I may, uh, I've spent my life at the State Department. We never preclude peace. That's what we're about. I would cite the precedent of uh, Kosovo, of Bosnia, of Rwanda, where we have successfully 
supported wars winding down through diplomatic means while also pursuing We kind of, well, uh, just about unconditionally won, too, and we captured those people, or somebody captured them and gave them to us. I mean, that's what you would have to imagine, and I, I do think that you need to think through this, because I don't think you or the administration have, or anybody that's calling for prosecution of Putin uh, for war crimes and saying this is genocide and all of these things and saying it's the Holocaust, because once you say that, I think you make uh, peace less likely. Nothing, nothing of what I'm saying is to say anything Putin has done is justified. I'm just saying that if you're going to say these things, you're very less likely to have any kind of peaceful settlement. Thank you. Senator Booker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our, our three witnesses today, really, for the work that you're doing. Uh, your your uh, commitment and your leadership at a time of global crisis is extraordinary, and I'm uh, just humbled and grateful for your professionalism and your focus, and obviously for you being here today. I want to mention um, how grateful I was in a bipartisan way that in the NDAA we were able to get some more reporting language requirements on the activities of the Wagner Group, and I'm very concerned, and it's already been addressed in some other questioning about uh, the um, Wagner's activities in Africa and can't lose sight of how this is all interrelated. We are in a moment in, a, in human history where um, this idea that might makes right, where you can invade your neighbor. Um, this is not just a Ukrainian issue. This is very much, as I think my senior senator and chairman said, an issue that um, all Americans should be concerned with. Uh, and if we don't face this Russian aggression here, uh, we will see uh, the crisis expand in ways to threaten uh, the world order and stability uh, that we have fought and invested in generations to establish, not just in Europe, but uh, globally. Um, I'd like to drill down, if I can, um, uh, about my ongoing concerns about food insecurity and how this is affecting um, uh, 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 global issues. Um, uh, Ukraine is obviously approaching its planting season. It's likely that their agricultural capacity will be further reduced by the effects of this invasion. Um, and this could, in turn, have just impacts on what we are seeing now, which is not just disruptions in the global food chain, but a, a level of food insecurity globally uh, that is uh, some of the highest it's ever been. And so I'm wondering what the administration is doing to plan ahead on this and what uh, further resources might be needed from Congress uh, to address uh, uh, the, the, the growing crisis of food insecurity globally. Why don't I start and then Assistant Administrator McKee can jump in. Uh, Senator, thank you for all of your support as well and your frequent travel. Uh, as I said in my opening, through the Black Sea Grain Initiative brokered by the UN, which we supported and helped midwife, we've uh, liberated about 17 million tons of Ukraine's grain. But as you said, their exports are still down about 30 percent, and there are risks for planting. Um, so from that uh, perspective, the money that the Congress has provided both last year and in FY23 uh, we are working uh, at every level f with the World Food Program, as you know, to speed uh, both food and um, fertilizer to countries that would normally be consumers of Ukraine and, frankly, Russia's output to ensure that they can plant this year. But Secretary Blinken is particularly focused on ensuring that we are working on this problem not just for today, but for tomorrow. And uh, particularly in Africa, but in other parts of the world, we have over um, years of climate change, civil war, um, other, other issues, drought, uh, seen soil degraded, seen crops become vulnerable, et cetera. So as we look at the uh, appropriation that you've just given us, we are focused in particular on soil health, on new kinds of seeds and varietals, um, particularly on the continent of Africa that can withstand climate change, on uh, f small farmer support, but also more systemic uh, answers to these questions. And we look forward to working with you. Erin, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I do, thank you, and um, I'd like to build on what Undersecretary Newland mentioned with respect to what we're doing inside Ukraine, who is key supplier of agricultural commodities and resources, but not uh, the only one, um, both getting the grain out but ensuring that the next planting season takes place. Um, so both through the Black Sea Grain Initiative as well as the Solidarity Lanes to ensure that all of the above, our, our ability to trust and rely on Putin to adhere to the agreement is um, something that a factor that we must 
take into account. As of at least uh, yesterday, there were 121 ships waiting to leave the port in Odessa. And uh, there's about four to five ships a day that, that through inspections that are sort of being slow rolled. So it's not um, the, it, it provided relief, but it is, is not the only solution. The greatest solution to helping uh, Ukraine both continue its agricultural contributions to uh, global food security is obviously to end the conflict. I want to thank you, though, um, for your um, highlighting uh, this important topic because, as you know, um, in 2022, just last year, over 205 million people were in urgent need of humanitarian food assistance, which was an 8% increase over 2021 and an 89% increase compared to 2016. So the global food security crisis that we're seeing today, created by climate change, the impacts of supply chain issues and everything and compounded and exacerbated by Putin's unjust war, um, are resulting in a, a crisis that we haven't seen, um, in at least in my lifetime. And I just want to add, uh, as I conclude, um, Russia is in this uh, doing a lot on disinformation to try to hide its responsibility for this crisis uh, and deflect responsibility. I think it's just really important, uh, especially as I just met with many African leaders, that we make it clear uh, that this is a crisis being caused by Putin's uh, war of choice, war of aggression. Thank you. Just to say, Senator, I, I, I feel that um, that message is getting through as you saw at the African Leader Summit, um, what they want is solutions, and that's why the support you've given us to work creatively with them is most important. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Under Secretary Newland, I'm curious about uh, how much information we've really been able to, to share with the public with regard to the reasoning behind our funding uh, for the, the, the Ukrainians in this war with Russia. Uh, many of us have the opportunity to, to get the classified discussions where we can be pretty frank about what's going on. I, I think there's a lot of folks out there that have not had the opportunity that we've had, and they will challenge whether or not we've been appropriate or, or uh, reasonable in our support, continued support, for Ukraine in this particular instance. Uh, would it be fair to say in, in, in this unclassified uh, discussion that the administration's policy uh, is, or the position is, that Ukraine can win this war against uh, Russian aggression? Senator, I think a year ago, none of us would have believed that we would be sitting here and Ukraine would still be standing as she is. That said, a third of her territory, as you know, is now held by Russia uh, illegally. So if we didn't think that this investment could push back Putin and turn back this uh, tactic uh, that is lawless and creates a world that none of us wants our children to live in, that you can just take a piece of your neighbor's property by force, and that's OK. Um, we would be not be asking you, we would not be asking the American people for this support. And so we've seen the gains that the Ukrainians were able to make through September. We are now, they want to push again very hard as the spring comes. And that is why you see these new forms of equipment that will help them, we believe, to push Russia back further this spring. So in terms of the administration's position, uh, our goal is one of on the ground seeing Ukraine regain lost land that uh, Russia has taken in in uh, in previous offensive moves. Is is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. So, longer term, uh, would it be the position that we continue to fund Ukraine as long as Russia has those ill-gotten gains in their possession? Uh, Senator, I think we're going to have to ensure that Ukraine has the defenses not only to continue to try to push Russia back, but to ensure that Putin can't reconstitute and come back. So, you know, one scenario one, one could see, and one that some think that the Russians favor, is a, a pause in this war now on these lines. Because that would give Putin 
time to rest and refit and rebuild his own military. And as we saw between 2014 and 2022, he will just be back and he will push further and he will come not just for Ukraine but for other, ter other countries around him. So it, it, that's why it has to end here. It, it may be semantics, but what we're really talking about is, is whether or not Ukraine can win this, this episode, this war. And part of what you're telling me is, is within the administration, it is a matter of taking back land from Russia and putting them in a position to where they will not be able to come back and attack again. Uh, and, and that suggests to me that, that we really do believe that Ukraine can win this war. Is that a fair statement? Or I, I'm trying to, to get you to either say, yes, we believe Ukraine can win the war, or we're not really making that statement. It, do we believe that Ukraine can win the war? We believe that Ukraine can regain the sovereignty to survive and thrive, and it can push Russia back further, yes. Does that mean they win the war? Ukraine will define what winning is, right? But yes, I believe so. So the administration has a belief that if we continue to fund their, their needs, and those needs have yet to be defined, it is based upon what the current requests are, do we know what the next requests are that would give them the ability to retake this land? So Senator, you, you and the American people have been very generous for FY23. We are assuming that what you have given us for 2023 will, uh, is what we will have through September. As we saw, you know, a year is an eternity in Ukraine, so we don't know what, where what, we what will I'm be in What I'm getting at is, is, is and, I, and I, I don't mean to be argumentative, but yeah. it's one thing to say that we're going to put resources in. It's another thing to say that Ukraine has made requests that we have either responded to and said no to, or Ukraine is making requests that we are not going to respond to. We just did the Abrams tanks after a lot of foot dragging. Are there other items out there that are in the near future that we intend to expand on that we have simply not talked about yet? Um, in this setting, I would simply say that we are working in particular now on speeding more air defenses, speeding more artillery, uh, speeding more ammunition uh, to the Ukrainians. You've given us the ability in the financing that we already have to do more uh, between now and September, and we are working with the Ukrainians as they proceed with their battle plans to uh, ensure that what we're giving meets the needs on the ground. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I apologize for going over. I just simply think it's really important that the American people understand that this has not been a one step at a time without knowing the direction that we're trying to go and that there really is a plan in place. And if not, there should be a plan in place with strategies in place to be ahead of the game rather than simply waiting for the next request in line. No, absolutely. And just understanding better what you were getting at, as you saw uh, from August to the Kherson offensive in October, we worked intensively with the Ukrainians on the kinds of equipment and other kinds of support and training that they needed to mount that offensive. They did that, and now they have plans for a spring offensive, and that's what we're focused on, both in terms of training and equipment. I don't know if Assistant Secretary Waller wants to add. My, my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I know members understand that we recognize, we cross back and forth, and we recognize members uh, who were present at the time of the, uh, of the beginning of the hearing. So I, I know some members have waited come back. But I just want to remind everybody of the rules. Senator Van Hollen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for your testimony and for your service. Um, Under Secretary Newland, um, thank you and the team for all you've been doing uh, to support the people of Ukraine, both on the military front, uh, the political front, uh, and the economic front. Um, my question relates to sanctions, uh, because I think we put in place early on um, important uh, sanctions on the Russian economy. Um, those include both financial sanctions, but also export controls. And I think, especially on the export control side, as time goes on, we've seen that they've had teeth. The Russians are trying to cast about the world, trying to get parts for infrastructure and military. Um, we also, of course, as you mentioned in your testimony, put in place um, an oil price cap. 
Um, and I, I do want to focus on that for a moment, because despite our sanctions, the reality is because of Russian oil exports, they continue to reap an awful lot of revenue to support their uh, war machine. Uh, and I think the price cap on oil was an important innovation. Uh, but I guess my question is, what impact have we seen? Because as I see it, I see some reduction in the price people are paying for Russian oil. But I want to know if Russians are making up for it on volume. Um, India, as you know, has been importing an awful lot of Russian oil. I just saw the other day Pakistan uh, decided to enter into a long-term oil purchase agreement with Russia. Uh, other countries around the world are looking for cheaper oil. Uh, are they making, in terms of Russian revenue from oil, uh, what is your projection as to both the impact of our sanctions and where, what we can expect it to be over the next, um, the remainder of the year? Well, thank you, Senator Van Holland. I think one of the success stories of this campaign with our allies is that Europe, which was heavily dependent on Russian oil, is now gone to zero, and that the U.S. has successfully been able to support them in that, as well as increasing our own LNG exports to Europe some 68%. So the oil price cap, which was a new tool of diplomacy, of financial diplomacy, which uh, folks, uh, some folks were skeptical of, has been extremely successful. Um, as you probably know, the price of Russian crude was over $100 a barrel before the price cap, and it's now um, trading at around 40, um, at 40 per barrel as of January 9th. So even if Russia is pumping more to India and other countries, uh, the profit margin that they're making on it is less. I frankly don't have in front of me the, the total numbers, but if we had not instituted the price cap along with our allies and partners, um, the revenues would have been off the charts. So, and, and countries like India that, that you know, need the oil but don't want to fund the fuel machine, the um, war machine, have a better option. Sure. Look, I'm going to uh, go from this hearing to a meeting with uh, the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, um, who's been very involved, as you know, in this, and try to get a full readout. But there, there's no doubt there's progress on the, on the, on the price of Russian oil. And I, I applaud the administration. That was an innovative approach. Uh, in terms of overall revenue coming into the Russian coffers, um, I think we need to be very watchful of, of that, because if the overall objective is to reduce the money coming in for the war machine. Um, less profit the Russians make, good, but um, so long as they're making some profit and make up for the lost profit in volume on revenues, um, we haven't achieved our overall objective, uh, at least in my view. Um, I know there have been some questions about the, the Wagner Group, um, including in the Central African Republic. Uh, reporting suggests Wagner is also very much in the mining business these days uh, in Africa, and some of those proceeds can also help fund the war against Ukraine. Could you talk specifically about the situation in Burkina Faso? Because I think we're familiar on this committee with what happened in Mali. A lot of us are very concerned about uh, the Wagner Group's penetration into uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, Senator, before you joined, I, I made reference to uh, new tranche of sanctions being announced today. They may already have been announced, which include uh, a large number of Prigozhin and Wagner targets, and particularly Wagner targets in Africa, those who help facilitate his network there. Um, we are very focused on Burkina Faso. I think, um, as I mentioned to you when I saw you in another setting, uh, I was there in October with an interagency delegation, along with Assistant Secretary uh, Wallander, and at that time, um, and continuing in a phone call that I had with the acting president or with the president, Traore, uh, around Christmas, he continued to say that he would not invite Wagner, that he was accepting Russian equipment, but that Berkanabe would fight for Burkina. We have strongly encouraged them uh, not to go in that direction and cited the example of the Central African Republic and Mali where they no longer control their own sovereignty, their own territory, their own mines, and that that's the property of Wagner and directly funds the war in Ukraine. Uh, we are continuing to work on that issue within the constraints that we have in a country that has had a coup 
um, Section 7008. We are encouraging those allies who can provide equipment to do so. Um, and uh, continuing our own uh, security support as we're allowed. Thank you. Right. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I'd like to state that um, I certainly want to see Ukraine win this conflict. The people of Tennessee, the people of America want to see that result too. And I'd like to associate myself with the comments of our chairman about having a blueprint in place to understand the path to get there. I think that's responsible and to the extent you're able to share that with us in this sort of setting or another, I would look forward to participating in that, uh, that, that goal. My, my real concern and what I'd like to talk to you, you first about is the magnitude of US funding of this and the accountability associated with it. Uh, right now, the United States is bearing the lion's share of the funding for the, the assistance, the military assistance to Ukraine. And we're doing that despite real concerns about accountability, about corruption, uh, President Zelensky recently, very recently, dismissed senior officials over corruption concerns. Uh, and and Amer many, many Americans, certainly many Tennesseans that talk to me, are very concerned about a type of open-ended commitment to Ukraine. And again, this gets back to what the chairman was raising, uh, having a clear picture of where we're headed, I think, would be most useful. The other concern I hear about, though, greatly is where the United States is relative to other European nations. Now, the countries that are most proximate to, you know, the, the, the border countries have really stepped up and punched above their weight when you look at the share of de their, their de defense spending versus their GDP. But you have other major economies in Europe that aren't pulling their weight. And when you look at it relative to the United States, you've got countries like Germany, where the United States is paying double our GDP versus what the, versus what the Germans are doing. We're doing 5x what France is spending as a percentage of GDP in terms of supporting this war. So my first question is, what are, you, what are we doing as a nation? What are you doing specifically to try to encourage these large European allies who are far more proximate to the problem to step up and do more? Thanks, Senator Haggerty. Um, we should compare our statistics because actually we have throughout this war worked very hard with our co coalition of some 50 partners, both on the security side and on the economic side, to ensure burden sharing. And our numbers indicate that our allies and partners around the world are carrying at least uh, half of the burden, if not more, in some categories, including some of the things that are hard to calculate, like the millions, 10 million or more Ukrainian refugees in, in some of their cities. And the recent announcement by the Germans of Leopard tanks uh, will make a significant increase uh, to their particular contribution. But uh, what I know it was I very painful getting the Germans to that point, but I appreciate the effort that went into yeah. play to get that to happen. And with regard to the longer term, as you know, we, we spoke about what's ahead uh, for the Ukrainians, which is this uh, strong push in the spring. And I think we'll see the results of that, and mm -hmm. that'll give us a sense. But um, you know, what, what they've made clear is they cannot pause now. That will only favor Russia. And we want to put them in the best possible position so that whether this war ends on the battlefield, whether it ends with diplomacy or some combination, that they are sitting on a map that is far more advantageous for their long-term future. Understood. And that Putin feels the strategic failure. I would just encourage continued efforts working with our European allies to get them to step up and find their way to the point that you just described where Germany got to the tank support. Please do more of that. Uh, can I go to presidential drawdown authority right now and what's, what's happened there? I, I've watched uh, this administration transfer billions of dollars worth of military equipment to Ukraine under the PDA. But I watch what's happening in Taiwan. And this is a source of frustration I think you and I may have discussed before. But right now, my understanding is that we have a $19 billion backlog, a years-long backlog of military equipment that is destined for Taiwan but is not yet there. I've spent a tremendous amount of time on our foreign military sales program here in America with our allies. The system does not work as well as it should. And I would very much appreciate the opportunity to hear from you if you have an immediate perspective and then later perhaps a briefing on where we're going with that. Uh, Senator, I'd like to come back to you on the specifics of, of Taiwan backlog and perhaps not in this setting, but uh, we agree with you that even as we support Ukraine and push back Russia, we have to uh, strengthen Taiwan's defenses and we are uh, engaged in that uh, intensively with the Pentagon. Yeah. Secretary Wilder, any further comments on that? No, simply to, to agree that 
uh, the Pentagon is focused on the acute fight uh, uh, and importance of supporting Ukraine, but at the same time is learning lessons for support of Taiwan uh, and shares concern about supply chain issues and fulfilling of contracts and has a focused working group led by uh, the acquisition and sustainment portion of OSD to focus exactly on that. I'll have my team reach out and arrange an update in the appropriate setting to follow up on this. Thank you both. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Schatz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'll start with uh, Secretary Wallander. Uh, the Biden administration has uh, so far been very successful in keeping allies unified uh, in response to Russian aggression. I think the last few days, maybe the last week, has been anomalous. Uh, can you tell me why and why we should be reassured that this was a blip on the screen and that we're going to move forward in a more unified fashion, especially as I assume wrangling has to happen all the time. The fact that it happened in public was, um, you know, not insurmountable, just a little bit of a stubbing of our toe, and we got through it, but I want to make sure that this is not the new normal and that we're going to go back to a, what I thought was pretty extraordinary uh, 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 coordination and unity. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the, the history of, of NATO, as um, Secretary, Under Secretary Newland can attest, is one of uh, bringing the alliance together because there is always a common purpose, um, but there are different ideas about how to get to that common purpose. And uh, we are really grateful and admiring of the work of European allies over the last year in pr bringing different capabilities, different uh, niches of uh, military capabilities, financing, support to Ukraine. And so it is a work in progress always. Uh, the specifics of the issue of how to move forward on armor, uh, you know, there was a lot of success built up over the previous weeks on APCs, on infantry fighting vehicles, on all kinds of armored vehicles. There was uh, intensive discussions about the right mix to get to Ukraine for the fight right away, as well as the long term, and uh, the urgency of the fight right now combined with, at the same time, thinking about what we needed to provide Ukraine for a longer-term capability did kind of emerge in public. But underneath, we've been working with uh, allies and partners all along, and we knew uh, that we would get to a resolution and a solution that provides Ukraine with the capability that it needs. Thank you. Um, uh, Secretary Newland. I want to talk to you about applying uh, Russia lessons to China, especially as it, re as it relates to the uh, economic sanctions regime. Um, couple of thoughts. First, if you could just elucidate briefly the differences, right? I think um, we had uh, uh, extraordinary success uh, and quickly in unifying uh, uh, not just allies, but almost the entire planet around a sanctions regime and economic isolation. That's a heck of a lot harder to do uh, if we're talking about China um, and, and an invasion of Taiwan. That's number one. So please talk about the differences. Number two is can you reassure me that there is an interagency process now on developing a sanctions regime? And I get the balance that you have to strike between signaling to China that there will be consequences, um, but also, tactically speaking, not telling them exactly what they might uh, uh, be facing so that they can um, spend five years figuring out a plan to evade um, um, those sanctions. So can you talk to me about where we are in that process? Thanks, Senator. Uh, in, in this setting, I'm going to say the following, and I look forward to following up in another setting if you'd like. Um, just as China is intensely learning the lessons of Putin's failure and the way the world responded, so are we thinking about applying um, the lessons to any future contingencies in Taiwan. Um, and frankly, we're speaking very clearly to the Chinese about it, but we're also speaking to the whole world about it. You know, were there to be a conflict, as you know, in the Taiwan Straits, 50% of global commerce would be disrupted. So if we've had food insecurity as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we'd have massive economic global dis uh, dislocation and China would be directly responsible. So that's a talking point that we're using not just with China, but with other allies. We're also, talking about the need to have, with, with every partner, whether it's a, 
um, an ally or whether it is a hedging state or whether it is a, a state with deep relations with China about the concern about having over-reliance, whether it's in their supply chains, whether it's in their strategic relationships, whether it's in debt on China and creating sure, the resiliency, right? I, so, the, but I do want to, and you don't, maybe this is not appropriate for, for an open session, but we're having a discussion about how to configure a sanctions bill or send the right signals. And I'd like for us to get it right and not polarize this issue about are you tough on China or not, um, and make sure that we don't telegraph things that we don't want to telegraph. I think that they should be clear that there will be severe consequences. I'm not sure that they should know exactly what they are because they may be capable of evading uh, those consequences if we tell them five years in advance. Thank you. I think we'd welcome the chance in another setting for those conversations. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for being here and for the work that you're doing every day. Um, Ambassador Newland, I would like to begin with Belarus. Um, last year, along with three other colleagues, we sent a bipartisan letter to Secretary Blinken about uh, plans to nominate a special envoy to Belarus to succeed Julie Fisher. Um, I did finally get a letter last night um, in response to that. And actually, Mr. Chairman, can I ask that we enter this letter into the record? Without objection. Thank you. Um, there was nothing in the letter that I was surprised or that I thought we wouldn't have known six months ago. So I guess my question is, while I know that the Belarus Affairs Unit continues to be very important in supporting pro-democracy movement in Belarus, um, can you tell me, if, are there plans to appoint a special envoy? And um, who currently leads the administration's policy on Belarus? Thank you, Senator Shaheen. And um, I'm gonna apologize on behalf of our department for taking six months to answer a letter from you. That's unacceptable, frankly. Um, we are looking for an appropriate candidate, a, a, a career candidate for this job. It's a complex job, as you know, because you have to work in Vilnius at this moment, uh, given the status. Uh, we have a very excellent uh, charge who is doing most of the on-the-ground contact work, but our Assistant Secretary for Europe and Eurasia, Karen Donfried, has been meeting with Belarusians, as has her deputy, Robin Donegan, at, at regular intervals to test whether there might be any openings there. I would not say that we've had manifest success, but also working intensively with the Belarusian opposition um, and uh, uh, Madam uh, Tukaneska um, and the Secretary has seen her regularly. So we're continuing to work on this and I hope we'll have somebody to talk to you about in the not too distant future. Great, well I would, I would point out that the congressional delegation in Halifax met with um, Ms. Tukaneska and um, she was also very um, concerned about the lack of a special envoy to address Belarus. Um, this next question is probably both for you and for um, Secretary Wallander, and it's really about Turkey's continued failure to ratify um, Sweden and Finland's accession agreement into NATO and the, their interest in getting F-16s and how we are addressing that issue with them. I would tell you that I, for one, am opposed to supporting um, providing F-16s to Turkey until they have ratified that agreement. And I, I think a number of my colleagues share that concern. I know there are other issues around those F-16s, but I just want to put that on the table as one of the concerns that I have. I think Sweden has moved very deliberately to address the concerns that were discussed with Turkey in terms of um, their uh, accession into NATO and that their President Erdogan, unfortunately, is using this, it appears, for his domestic political interests as opposed to really addressing what's in the interest of NATO and the security agreement that we need as we support Ukraine in their fight against Russia. So I don't know which of you would like to address that. When I start, uh, we agree with you, Senator Shaheen, that Finland and Sweden are ready to join NATO now, and we were grateful for the speedy ratification 
here, um, and as you know, almost all allies have now ratified with the exception of, of Hungary and Turkey. This comes up in every single conversation we have with Turkey and we have tried to, the Swedes, as, as you know, have put forward a roadmap that they worked through with Turkey. They've met many of those benchmarks and they're continuing to uh, try to do more there. Um, we have made the same point to our Turkish allies that you just made, that we need uh, this Congress's support uh, moving forward for the security enhancements that we think that they need as allies, F-16, some of them are old, um, but that this Congress is likely to look far more favorably on that after ratification. So um, keep making your, your points and we will too. Thank you. Would you like to add? To that? I, I would just add that the Defense Department makes precisely the same points to our Turkish allies at every opportunity. Uh, and reinforces that uh, in the process, uh, in the democratic processes that support American foreign policy, the Congress plays an important role and they need to take that seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have lots of questions about Russian influence in the Balkans, but I will save that for another time. Thank you. Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and welcome to all of you. I wanted to uh, start by having you all, and particularly you, Secretary Newland. Uh, to uh, address uh, both with India, with South Africa, with the ASEAN nations, uh, the difficulty in getting them to take a strong stand against Russia. I think it particularly bothers me with democracy in South Africa as uh, democracies. Uh, and um, we have strong partnerships with countries like the Philippines that, and, uh, and a new government there. And yet we're not really seeing them as, as, as robustly supportive of defending uh, the, a republic against a, a dictatorial aggression. Uh, Senator, let me start with the Philippines and the new government where actually they have um, been quite strong supporters of Ukraine, including uh, voting with us uh, in the United Nations against the annexation of, of Ukrainian territories. Uh, including some other work we're doing together um, on security support, et cetera. Um, with regard to um, South Africa and India, as you know, these countries have longstanding historic intertwinings uh, with Russia. We have been making the case regularly with them that these dependencies that they've created um, make them more vulnerable. Um, and we will continue to do that. In the case of the oil price cap, as you know, uh, which India was quite skeptical of, they're now major beneficiaries because the oil that they're buying from Russia is, is so much cheaper. And we are now working with them on ways to diversify away from Russian, Russian weapons. I'll be in India next week talking about that among, among other things. The South African situation is, is complex and is also tied to some of the um, politics uh, inside South Africa, but I would look forward to talking with you off, offline about some of those things. Great, and uh, I'm glad to hear that you're going to, uh, to India, uh, and uh, I would think that after the performance of, of Russian weapons on the battlefield has been demonstrated, they might be somewhat less interested, and also that's a big issue with the ASEAN countries, many of which depend on Russian weapons. Are you proceeding on to Jakarta or to the ASEAN lobbying after you're in India? Um, this, this trip is uh, South Asia, it is uh, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and then on to Qatar to work on some of the Afghan SIV issues. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we have uh, under sec uh, Deputy sec Secretary Sherman, Secretary uh, Councillor Chalet have all made these same points in ASEAN. And you know, on my last trip to India, that was one of the first things we said, look at how these weapons perform on the battlefield. But mm -hmm. I think they find themselves after 60 years of entanglement having to find alternatives, and that's part of the job we have to do is help them uh, with alternatives. Yes. I want to turn to the, uh, the, the stories that have been raised about corruption concerns. Zelensky has fired several people. Uh, there are stories about the military paying a lot more than market price, which always implies uh, corruption in buying uh, food. Uh, it's, it's important for us to really work uh, diligently to support uh, Zelensky's government in taking on corruption because it, it will be a kind of a cancer eating way of, at support uh, that uh, they need from everyone in the world. And I just get your insights and commentary on that. Um, Assistant Secretary McKee may have more to add, but 
um, as I said in my opening, what Ukrainian patriots are fighting for and what we in the international community are supporting is a more democratic, cleaner, more European Ukraine. I think Zelensky is very conscious of that and we have been very clear that we need to see, even as they prosecute this war, the anti-corruption steps, including good corporate governance and, and judicial measures move forward. We agree with you that the fact that a number of folks have been dismissed or forced to resign as their cases are being um, pursued, that's, that sends a very strong signal to others who would try to rip off this war effort and uh, uh, is important uh, for the future of Ukraine. Thank you. A last uh, a question. Uh, my, my colleague was mentioning concern that Europeans aren't putting as much into support of Ukraine as, as we are. Um, and. Um, but I, I wonder what that analysis looks like if one considers the much higher prices that they're paying for uh, energy or to host refugees, and if you have any sense of how all that balances out in terms of our thinking about the sacrifices that the European partners are making. Well, thank you for raising that, Senator Merkley. I did mention the, the refugee burden, some 10 million refugees hosted all over Europe, which, you know, impacts uh, towns and communities all over the continent, and you see that everywhere. Um, but your point about the fact that, you know, m most of my European friends report a 300% increase in their energy bills over the winter, and if you just think about the sticker shock that that would create if it were happening here, you're absolutely right. Um, but um, that speaks to uh, the fact that they have now woken up to the fact that the dependence that they had on Russian oil was um, uh, bad for their national interest. And, and so there will be, uh, as hard as this has been, there will be good structural changes that come out the other end. If there is uh, any analysis that, that, that weighs those different financial factors together to paint a more complete picture, I'd just be interested in seeing it. Thank you. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to each of the witnesses. Uh, Ms. Newland. as you know, in January of last year, the Senate voted on my legislation to impose sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And it did so before Russia had invaded Ukraine. When the Senate voted on those sanctions, President Zelensky publicly urged, even begged, the United States Senate to pass those sanctions. And President Zelensky said, Passing those sanctions then were the last chance to prevent Russia from invading Ukraine, the last chance to prevent Russian tanks rolling into Ukraine. Was President Zelensky wrong? Senator Cruz, uh, like you, I am and I think the administration is very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now, as you like to say, a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. I personally, um, having been involved along with my boss, Secretary Blinken, in all of those negotiations with Russia to try to prevent this war in December, do not believe that had that Nord Stream 2 been cut off in January, that would have been decisive for Putin. It was important that the day the war began, the Germans cut the pipeline, as did the rest of the Europeans, but he was bound and determined to go into Ukraine, as you know. So you believe Zelensky was wrong when he said stopping Nord Stream 2 was, was the last and best way to stop this war? I don't think it would have stopped Putin, and, you know, I And, and I, when, I the wish, government, when the government of Poland similarly said, begged the United States Senate to pass those sanctions and said this is the last and best opportunity to stop Russia from invading Ukraine. You believe Poland was wrong too? I do not believe we would have prevented this war had the Europeans acted faster on Nord Stream 2. I wish it were the case, but I don't think it would have stopped. Okay, well let's talk about how the war is going. And I know that you and I both agree that it is important for Russia to suffer a crushing defeat. Putin is a KGB thug and he's committed to undermining our interests and our enemies across the globe, including in particular China, are watching carefully what happens in Ukraine. The Iranian regime is watching as well. And Iran is committed to doing everything they can to ensure Putin's victory. 
They're supplying Putin with resources, especially drones, which are devastating Ukrainian civilians and military assets. Meanwhile, the Biden administration, which waived the sanctions on Nord Stream 2, the last and best hope of preventing the war, right now today continues to be obsessed with a new nuclear deal with Iran. Iranian officials say talks remain ongoing, while administration officials say they remain committed to diplomacy, but not right now. I'm deeply concerned that this administration, even in the middle of a war, is subordinating the need to counter the Russian-Iranian alliance to its own partisan political preferences. For example, this administration has dropped the general UN arms embargo against Iran. This administration has made Russia our intermediary in nuclear talks with Iran. This administration has issued sanctions waivers, allowing the Ayatollah to become Putin's nuclear client. This administration has withheld weapons for Ukraine to target Iranian operatives in Crimea, helping Russia launch drones. And this administration has avoided using relevant sanctions authority against Iranian banks, facilitating the transfer of drones to Iran. As a result, Iran has been able to dramatically boost Putin's war in Ukraine. Meanwhile, America and the American taxpayer are sh shouldering the burden of assisting Ukraine, while the Biden administration is greasing both sides of this war. Let's talk about Iran's supply of drones to Russia. The Biden administration made an immediate decision to go to the United Nations and drop the general UN arms embargo on Iran because they say it was required by the original JCPOA nuclear deal. Biden officials say part of the embargo dealing with drones is still in place, but even that measure will expire this fall pursuant to the JCPPA. I believe the Biden administration should immediately go to the UN, invoke our snapback authority, and keep the embargo in place. Do you agree? Or do you believe we should allow the UN arms embargo on Iran to expire and allow Iranian drones to continue to go to Russia and be, be used against the people of Ukraine? Time of the Senator is expired, but please answer his question. Thank you. Senator Cruz, you are absolutely right that Iranian drones are fueling this war, and that is why we have taken uh, many, many increased sanctions measures against Iran over the last uh, couple of months, including against the IRGC Guard Corps Aerospace Force, the Quds Force Aviation Industry, the Shahid Aviation Industry, Russian Aerospace Forces. The have you stopped the drones? Uh, we have not stopped the drones, and this is part of the problem. Um, but we know what Iran looks like, and we also know who Russia's friends are, Iran, North Korea, and Hamas. Um, as you know, we are not currently in active discussions with Iran. Um, you know, it is not prepared to, ne to take these negotiations seriously right now, and we have many of the same concerns that you have, but I look forward to speaking with you in a separate setting about our larger strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran. I think this is probably not the appropriate setting for that. Thank you. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Menendez, uh, and thank you, uh, all three of you, for your service and for your work to um, continue to help lead um, the efforts of our administration in combating Russia's aggression in Ukraine. Um, I thought the recent decision taken jointly by the United States, Germany, and a number of other um, NATO allies and European partners, soon to be NATO allies, um, to send main battle tanks as well as to send Bradleys and strikers from our Department of Defense was the right one. Um, I'm assuming, if I might, um, that this was not factored into your supplemental request last year. Uh, and on behalf of the DOD, um, and if anyone else wants to speak, fine. But what impact does it have on available resources uh, for this new commitment to have made? Um, and are there any additional uh, resources or assistance required um, to meet the additional requirements, both security and non-security, of deploying Abrams? Thank you, Senator. Um, the uh, DOD has a very focused process in preparing PDA packages and USAI packages uh, in light of what the Ukrainians prioritize 
what our assessment uh, is that they require as well, uh, what the readiness impacts are and what the costs are and deliver deliverability of the capabilities are. So while you are correct that the specific capabilities of the last couple of weeks were not previewed necessarily uh, in the original supplemental, uh, the scope of the supplemental for which we are grateful is, is it does accommodate um, this planning and ongoing planning. That does not preclude that we may need to come back uh, to request additional funding, but for now we are in a very good place uh, for that deliberate planning and constant provision of capability to Ukraine. Well, I think it's a positive step forward that complements the Bradleys and Strikers that were already uh, announced. I, I do think it's important for us to ensure um, that the assistance uh, made possible by the $45 billion um, supplemental appropriations at the end of last year is used as intended, um, that any misuse is identified and addressed. Um, I've raised these issues uh, directly with President Zelensky last week uh, with the Deputy Prime Minister, the Mayor of Kyiv, uh, with a number of legislators from Ukraine, uh, also with our team um, in Kyiv when I visited in November. Um, we provided um, significant additional resources through the state and foreign operations appropriations uh, provisions for both USAID and state OIGs. Um, I think enhanced oversight is a good idea. Uh, I'd be interested um, whether, um, Ms. Newland, you might describe whether you think the accountability and oversight mechanisms currently in place have been effective, um, and what, if anything, we need to do to strengthen them, and if I might also, Ms. Wallander. Uh, thank you, Senator Coons, for your attention and support for all of this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a layered approach on the civilian side. As you know, uh, we have extra staff, thanks to you and the embassy, who are focused on accountability. We have the um, budget support that uh, is the bulk of the economic support funds goes through the World Bank, so they actually pay the salaries, et cetera, that we are intending to support and is double monitored by Deloitte. Um, we also have, as you said, all of our AIG, uh, OIGs are very, very active. In fact, all three of them, state, AID, and the Department of Defense, as we sit here, they are on the ground in Kyiv now uh, doing their first look at all of this. And I won't speak for my colleagues, but when I was in Kyiv in uh, December, I got a very intensive brief from the military about how they're accounting for every single um, artillery shell, it's quite impressive. So did I in November, and I, I found it constructive. I just think it's important for our colleagues to get as much of this as we possibly can. I have just a minute left. If either of you'd like to speak briefly to it. Thank you, Senator. I wanted to add to, in addition to uh, what Undersecretary Newland mentioned vis-a-vis uh, -vis the reimbursement process for direct budget support through the World Bank and, and verifying through third party monitoring that those arrears that we are covering are valid. Um, we also entered into just last month uh, an interagency agreement with the GAO that is going to work with uh, the financial systems and the Ministry of Finance, of course, um, in Ukraine to strengthen their own audit capability and with their supreme audit authority to make more robust their internal controls as well. And so we are moving out and expanding both our internal capacity building as well as third party uh, monitoring and oversight. Thank you. I'm near the end of my time. I have another colleague waiting. I'll just comment that I'm, I'm glad to see uh, the administration's decided to sanction uh, the Wagner Group. I'm very concerned uh, about the scope and reach of their impact. Um, during the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, um, uh, we pulled together a meeting of five um, coastal West African national leaders who expressed grave concern about their stability and security. Um, and I think uh, Russia's uh, malign um, actions are not limited to Ukraine uh, by any um, extent, and I'm concerned about uh, a number of countries in Africa, um, which I'd be happy to work with you further on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kane, let me go to another part of the world. I have questions for Secretaries Newland and Wallander about Russian activity in the Americas. Um, in June, past June, uh, President Ortega in Nicaragua authorized Russian troops planes and ships that deploy to Nicaragua for purposes of training law enforcement or emergency response. Russia called this a routine development. Uh, in September, Ortega reached an agreement with Putin to air Russian-produced media content through Russia's Sputnik radio network available to more than 20 Nicaraguan state channels broadcasting to the country's nearly 7 million people. In Venezuela, Russia has supported the oil industry, helped 
Venezuela skirt U.S. sanctions and sent military personnel and equipment to the country. Some observers think that following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Maduro's fortunes have improved because in uh, large part due to our campaign to limit people using Russian oil revenues and the U.S.'s consequent need for other oil partners, the uh, Venezuelan economy and, and energy situation has, has gotten better. So I want to ask a couple of questions about this. First to Secretary Newland. Russia state media conducts active disinformation campaigns in Latin America through outlets like RT in Espanol, Sputnik Mundo and RT Play in Espanol. How is the department working with others to counter Russian disinformation efforts in the region? Senator Kane, thanks for this um, and for your support of our efforts to beat back both um, Russian malign inf influence and Chinese malign influence in the Americas. Uh, we have robust uh, programs both through our media hub for Latin America, through all of our travel and through our embassy platforms to uh, speak back ourselves but also strengthen investigative journalism and um, government journalists' um, understanding of how the Russian disinformation networks work and to be able to expose it as they see it. Of course, in countries like Nicaragua and Venezuela, who have set their lot with Russia, they're not so interested in hearing it, but we do what we can in the Americas more, more uh, broadly with regard to that. To um, Secretary Wallander, what's the DOD assessment of the level of Russian military activity in Nicaragua or more generally in the region? Senator, the, the first and most important duty of the Department of Defense is to protect the American homeland. So the department is always uh, devoting resources in tracking, monitoring, and uh, planning to deter and defend against any threat to the homeland. Um, the department does not currently assess that there is an, uh, a heightened threat to the American homeland because of Russian presence, but it is something that is tracked and monitored every day. Uh, Russian presence uh, facilitated by countries like Nicaragua is of course um, a, a major focus of uh, tracking and, and watching. So I can reassure you that this is not uh, lost upon us, um, but also reassure that we don't see a heightened threat in the current circumstance. The, in, in recent visits to the region um, and discussion with heads of state there, um, the Chinese presence is very dominant economically and, and more and more military activity. And the Russian presence is not at, at the same level. And I think a number of folks there see it as more kind of opportunistic or to kind of annoy us. Um, but it, we, we would be foolish to take it for granted. So we have to just keep monitoring it. And I appreciate um, the witnesses for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kane. Uh, let me just join, uh, and I really appreciate Senator Kane's focus on the Americas. Um, it's great to have someone else who cares about it. Um, I, I want to echo his concerns about Russia's uh, footprint in the hemisphere. You know, same as with China. We say that China is our biggest geostrategic challenge. That means challenging it in every dimension in every part of the globe. Uh, here with Russia, we see a footprint in Venezuela the president of Russian security services in the country, cooperation with the Maduro regime on intelligence and cyber capabilities, its ability to influence democratic institutions in neighboring countries, the fact that Maduro invited Russia to attend negotiations in Mexico City, media reports last year about the presence of Russian radar deployed along Venezuela's border, utilized to surveillance the Colombian government's institutions. I know this is something you spoke about publicly during your travel to Bogota last year. Uh, we, we need to be focused multidimensionally uh, as it relates to Russia and for that part China in our own hemisphere. And if you're going to beat someone who you consider your single biggest geostrategic challenge, i.e. China, and if we're going to continue to weaken Russia in every dimension we can as it relates to the war in Ukraine, that means playing three-dimensional chess, and that means also focusing in the hemisphere. I, I, I hope that the questions that Senator Kane raised in, in this comment helps us create some focus. I'd love to hear from our Assistant Secretary of the Western Hemisphere about the, that focus in this regard. Mm -hmm. 
just quickly, Senator, to say that you mentioned it, you alluded to it, but one of the greatest risks is democratic backsliding across the hemisphere. And as these countries, mm -hmm. too many countries, follow Putin and Xi Jinping's model of governance and control judiciaries and control free press, et cetera. So that's part of the, the larger message. If I may just go back, I, uh, Senator Haggerty asked me if Ukraine can win. Uh, I believe, and I believe the, all of us believe, that if we define winning as Ukraine, surviving and thriving as a cleaner democratic state, it can. And it must, and it will, with our help. Thank you. Uh, now, I, uh, I uh, disagree with my colleague from Texas's uh, characterization of this administration. I think no one has been more insightful, decisive, and helpful to the Ukrainians than the Biden administration. And to suggest something else is just a parallel alternate universe, but some of us seem to live there. Uh, in any event, uh, there is one thing, though, that I do want to uh, echo on, and that is Iranian drones. Iranian drones have been present on the Ukrainian battlefield now for months. It's inflicting massive damage to military and civilian infrastructure across the country. We're reading troubling reports that Russia now intends to acquire Iranian ballistic missiles that can strike deep even into Europe, which would be a game changer. I, how is the administration responding to the growing military alliance between Iran and Russia? And what measures, in this case particularly in concert with our allies, who should understand that it is in their interest, particularly European interests, to be more robust as it relates to Iran, if Iran produces the missiles that it already has the capacity and breadth of scope of reach and greater sophistication in terms of targeting to Russia that can hit different targets in Europe, it's, it's, it's a dramatically different world. They need to be engaged with us. They have been reticent because they're looking for the JCPOA. Even the Iranians are not interested in the JCPOA. So they need to now understand that the risk for them is greater. And the risk for all of us collectively as it relates to success in Ukraine is greater if the Iranians can do all of this with impunity and not face further consequences. Couldn't agree more, Senator, including about the risk of Russian tech, uh, missile technology helping the Iranians get better at that themselves. We are engaged in intensive conversations uh, with our key allies and partners about strengthening the sanctions regime in response to this, as you know we've done, and as I mentioned earlier, a number of sanctions ourselves. We're also engaged in a number of other things which I think we should talk about in another setting. And we I'm look happy forward to do to that. I would just simply suggest that the Europeans have been reticent about multilateralizing what is our sanctions as it relates to Ukraine. The door is closed from my perspective on the JCPOA, because Iran itself has not sought to accept what I thought was a bad deal, but nonetheless even that bad deal. They're not willing to accept it. So at the end of the day, now they're helping Russia. We're pouring enormous amounts of resources, as are the Europeans, to help Ukraine win this battle for itself and for the greater existential threat. It seems to me now the, the Europeans should think differently about joining us in sanctions on Iran so that they understand, that the, the Iranians understand there are consequences to their actions, because right now they don't. This uh, record of this hearing will remain open to the close of business tomorrow. We thank all of you for your appearance and for your insights, and this hearing is adjourned.